Perfect. So, what's your name? My name is Takekayo. And where do you come from? Uh, originally, I was born in Japan, and then I moved to Canada when I was quite young, and I've spent the rest of my life in Canada. And which part of uh, Canada? Oh, on the west coast, in, on because Canada is a big country. Yes, I guess I should course. explain. Yeah. So I, I'm in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. So for those of you that don't know Canada, Vancouver is just north of Seattle. Mm -hmm. And what what do you think is the best part of Vancouver? Why is it nice to live there? Well, I don't live in the part that I want to live in. Mm -hmm. So we live in, a, in Burnaby, which is just the one city over from, from Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And we live in a very beautiful, nice part of North Burnaby. Eagles flying above, wow. lots of trees and parks. But I like the grittiness of uh, the East Vancouver, because that's where I grew up. Mm -hmm. And specifically, I love Chinatown Vancouver, because mm -hmm. it's such a vibrant community. There's uh, people selling things just on the street. Lots of interesting people, lots of older, we call them aunties and uncles, mm -hmm. wearing colorful clothing. And so to me, that's where I want to be. But uh, unfortunately, I also have to cater to my wife and she loves the trees and the mountains and, and the eagles flying above. Perfect. And what, what do you think it would be the difference between an American uh, town and a Can Canadian town? I think it's, at times it could be subtle, but I would uh, say, especially along the west coast of Canada and the United States, we probably are more com in common in terms of uh, culture and lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So I would have more in common with someone in San Francisco mm -hmm. than I would with someone in Toronto. Ah, okay. So they often say when I visit Seattle or, or San Diego or San Francisco, people would ask for me in, for directions because mm -hmm. they, they think I'm a local. I think we dress similar, like t-shirt mm -hmm. and shorts, mm -hmm. you know, where in Toronto, I, I feel out of place a little bit, even though it's my own country, like politically and culturally, mm -hmm. I find that the West Coast, East Coast, so for me, I would fit in really nicely in Seattle, mm -hmm. where Toronto may be a little bit more difficult. So um, in a way, that's good, I think, right? It's more of a regional yeah, difference yeah. than a political difference, yeah. yeah, between Canada and the United States. Oh, that's nice. And how did you get into photography? I got into it from my older brother. He was studying in Japan on a scholarship and came back with almost like this, just mm -hmm. a whole bunch of cameras and lenses. Mm -hmm. And I, at the time, I only saw photography as a, as a tool for documenting things, mm -hmm. as a very, like a, like a photocopy machine, a very functional tool. Mm -hmm. I never thought of it as a, as a way to express myself artistically. Mm -hmm. And so when he came back and he explained to me, oh, you could put black and white in film in here and put a different ISO here and oh, this is a macro lens and oh, this is, this is for sports and this is an ultra wide. And I was asking him all these questions. My mind was, was so fascinated. You know, it's like learning new functions on a mm -hmm. photocopy machine. Oh, it could do double sides. Mm -hmm. It could do all these things. And, and then I realized that um, up to that point, I was a writer and a musician. Mm -hmm. And I used writing and music as a form of expression, self-expression. Mm -hmm as a form of a language. And then I realized photography is a visual language. Yes. I could, the same way as I can write a short story or the same way I can write music, I can write stories through images, mm -hmm. you know, other than just it being a, a, a literal snapshot of what I see, but I can manipulate what I see. I can use filters, you can use different ISOs, you can blur the image. And then from then on, I was hooked you know, I, I decided to dedicate the rest of my life pursuing, either if it was a job or just as a hobby, it didn't really matter to mm -hmm. me. Um, I would pursue photography as my primary means of storytelling, mm -hmm. visual storytelling. Perfect. And what, what are you, do you have a favorite lens or something like that, or a favorite camera, or is, is it? Yeah, I think it's, it would come down to a, a multi-layer of, of things that intersect. In terms of a field of view, I would say a 28 millimeter is my favorite. This one? Um, okay. Yeah, 28. So I have my 28 uh, Simicron here on this Leica M10R. But even my first 28 that I fell in love with was a Ricoh GR1. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's nice. It's just a quick snap shooter. And it gave that kind of, um, especially with black and white film, I found that I felt like a, a photojournalist. You get really close. Mm -hmm. And then that's when you start realizing that in the physical space between you and your subject is really important. Mm -hmm. Yes. And when you shoot, use a point and shoot and you can get in close without, people do this with an iPhone, right? Mm -hmm. So I can shoot, I can photograph you with a, about a 28, but arm's length. So I can get, physically I'm not close to you, but the camera's close. Mm -hmm. So you get this feeling of, of intimacy with your subject. 
Uh, you could do that with the Ricoh GR1. You know, you know it autofocus, so you just stick your arm out without having to look through the viewfinder. Mm -hmm. Once you're good at it, you know what a 28 can do, mm -hmm. and you just shoot. And then when I looked at the photos, it looked like a 24 or 21 because I was so yes. close. And I realized that people are uh, more disarmed when you you kind of keep a, a mm -hmm. at least if they don't know you very well. And so to me, a 28 is just a perfect balance of uh, street photography. Uh, photojournalism, even sort of uh, environmental portraiture. Yeah. People might want to use the 35 or 50 to get the bokeh, the shallow depth of field, but I want context in my photos. And I think with the 28 F2, you can still get a bokeh if you want, mm -hmm. or you stop down the F5.6 and get more contextual images. And so if I can, you know, that whole deserted island with one lens, 100% it'll be a 28 for sure. Yeah. So maybe like a Leica Q2. It's with a yes, so to me, I like a Q2. As much as I like it, I like the size of the Ricoh GR series, yeah. but with no, it has no EVF. Yeah. It has no articulating screen. Yeah. I like the X100V, but it's a 30, it's a 35 equivalent. Right. But you could add the 28 uh, attachment, but then it makes it too long. Right, yeah. And the Q2 is a nice size, but the lens is too big. Mm. So I'm still looking for, to me, this is almost the perfect size, maybe not the perfect weight, but the perfect size. But, you know, it's, it's more of an air-cooled Porsche. Mm -hmm. You know, it's more work to get the great image, but sometimes you just want a quick snap shooter. So you see something quick, boom. And unless you're really good and focused, it's much harder to do that with a, with a lens and a camera like this. So I'm still looking for that perfect camera, that perfect 28 millimeter point and shoot that I can carry in my pocket. And actually to me, uh, the Nikon 28 Ti, mm -hmm. the film point and shoot, the Minolta TC1, mm -hmm. those are both 28 uh, uh, cameras. I wish there was a digital version of that. It doesn't yet exist, yeah, so I keep, on, I keep on looking. Yeah. And how did you get into uh, YouTube, making your own videos? Yeah, it was actually by accident. I met uh, an early YouTuber blogger named Eric Kim. Mm -hmm. He came into Vancouver doing one of his workshops and he I explained to him what I was doing, which is I was blogging. I was just writing articles for my blog. It was very cool to be a blogger in 2012, 2013. Okay. Writing my own articles, my own thoughts on photography, reviewing gear. And I met him, we had lunch. He invited me to audit his workshop, which was very nice of him. And then he said, you should do YouTube. And I said, well, I don't know if I'll be good. And he says, oh, I will do a video on you. So he just interviewed, like we're doing now. Mm -hmm. He just did a, a, a YouTube interview with me. And uh, he, he just recommended, said he just put a camera in your face and just start talking. He said, some people, just do it. you might think you'll be really good at YouTube and maybe you'll be really bad. Or someone might say, oh, I'm really shy. I don't think I'll be good. And you might be the best YouTuber. He said, you never know until a camera's in your face. Mm. So he said, just give it a try. Who knows? Just, you don't even have to post it. So I did it. I showed my wife. She said, oh, you know, that's kind of funny. Just go for it. So that's, it was really by accident. I didn't even want to do YouTube. Perfect. So, yeah, so you are doing it for 10 years? Oh, well, I guess maybe eight years. Mm -hmm. it's, I guess, I mean, it's, sometimes it's hard to remember because of COVID. You have to kind okay, of minus yeah. the three years. So it, it feels more like five or six years, I guess. But yeah, it's, it's maybe closing in on 10, maybe in two years. So I think eight years. And what was the biggest, in, in quotes, learning to do videos? I think for me, it was the technical aspect mm -hmm. of it. I know other people struggle with different things, like maybe content, mm -hmm. like what do I talk about every week? But because I was a writer, because um, me creating content was so easy and because I talk too much, I always have much, a lot of ideas. I think you're probably the same. I mean, you don't talk too much, but you have ideas yeah, always rolling in your head and you need some place to, I don't want to say regurgitate, but somewhere to put okay. it either on paper or on photos or on YouTube. So I just, so that part of it was easy. Mm -hmm. Content, I can do a new video every day if I have to. The problem was editing. Mm -hmm. uh, my first YouTube videos was one cut, one take. If halfway through I made a mistake, my wife would stop and we would redo the whole thing. And then I had no notes because I was just going off of my head and I would just start all over again. So understanding that, oh, like I started with iMovie and I still use iMovie because it's okay. so simple. Mm -hmm. I actually bought Final Cut mm -hmm. and it could do so many more things, but I'm lazy to learn it. I just want to get my ideas mm -hmm. out. To me, YouTube is like post-it notes for me. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I'm not writing a novel, it's quick ideas, get it out there fast and get it out of my head so that I can think about something new. 
And so I know there's a lot of YouTubers that were much smaller than me that when I met them, they looked up to me and said, oh, Taka, I love your YouTube videos. And I, I look at their quality and it's like, oh, you will be bigger than me. Mm. I could tell already that they have all the qualities that I have, but they also have the skill set of, of editing and adding music and, and nice titling and all these things. I think, oh, like I, I'm too lazy to do those things. So I'm very happy for them because they want to be YouTubers. They want to, um, you know, grow and, 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 and build a business and the ecosystem around the YouTube channel. But for me, it's, to me, it's still like a post-it note. It's a place where I dump my ideas and I create content that makes me happy. I don't cater to the algorithms. I don't cater to what uh, sponsors or advertisers have. So that's why I don't have a lot of sponsored or advertising um, on my channel because it has to really align. So if I have a great video, I might ask a few sponsors, hey, would you want to sponsor? If they say no, I just post it without sponsors anyways because I just want to create these, uh, the, this content that makes me happy and I think that the photo community would also enjoy. And if I don't make too much money from it, then, <laughs> then it's okay, I'll, I'll have to do something else to make money. Perfect, and what are your plans for the future? I think to continue to build relationships with brands, uh, including 1011.9. I'm not sure if this is a 1011.9 branded <laughs> content, but you know, I also love sneakers. Mm -hmm. Sneakers. Mm -hmm. I also love watches. I love um, music. And to be able to make, you know, someone like Casey Neistat, you know, he is the subject. Yeah. He could talk videos. about, yeah. yeah, and it's organic because he's yeah. such a, he's like a kid. And I think yeah. maybe a lot of us are like that, yeah. which is both good and bad. We yeah. need to grow up one yeah. day, right? <laughs> no, but, not but, really. <laughs> not really. But at least that aspect of us to remain childlike and curious is very important. Mm -hmm. But there's other things that we need to be responsible for. You know, yeah. you, you, got, you got to pay your taxes and you got, you got to, you know, be nice to your mama and your papa and, and to, your, to, your, uh, to your partners and stuff. And there's growing up things you need to do. But uh, Casey Neistat's a good example because his channel is about him. Mm -hmm. And of course, he's a cinematographer, he's a movie maker, he makes cool videos. But if he does a Samsung video and he does an Apple video, there's no, con there's no, like, he, there's no conflict. Yeah. You know, whatever he likes, he likes. And I, and I want my channel to be more about that, but I'm still a photographer, where Casey Neistat is a cinematographer. So I'm a photographer that loves mostly camera gear, but I review bags, camera bags, but also lifestyle bags. But also I want to embed watches and sneakers and anything I want. Like if I want to do a restaurant review, I want to do a restaurant review. And I want it to be on brand because throughout my channel, throughout my articles that I write, people are like, oh, Take, I do sometimes pictures of me eating and it's like cameras and my lunch. And so people are like, oh, like Take likes Hong Kong style cafes. And you know, when I do a Hong Kong style cafe restaurant review, people are like, oh yeah, that's on brand because that's, he always talks about this Hong Kong, what is with this Hong Kong cafe? So I wanna be able to do those things organically and build my brand, not necessarily YouTube, build my brand and my brand awareness so that I can continue doing what I love uh, and make other people happy doing what I love and hopefully they would get something out of it, you know, more than just a gear review, but just kind of give them good ideas and inspire them to do what they want to do as well. That's perfect because I really like your videos because it's you and uh, you show nice things and yeah, very nice. But, so, but more travel things, you yes, know. Yes, that's my next question. Is there any um, a place that you will visit in the near future? Um, well, I'm in Germany now okay. and I would love to have a, a closer connection to Germany. I think being Japanese, uh, also much like Germany, they are um, manufacturing powerhouses. Mm -hmm. So as much as I love art, I also love things, I love tools. And Germany is a great place for, for, for camera tools, mm. but as well as, you know, I, I love stationery. I mm. love pens and Japanese you know, are great for stationery pens, pencils, pencil cases in Germany is, is, is very similar. And so to be able to build a closer relationship with Germany and Canada and Japan and as well visit more parts of Europe because I think that's one area where living on the west coast in Vancouver, most of us go to Asia. Okay. It's a gateway to Asia. Mm -hmm going to Europe feels even kind of culturally much further away. Oh, okay. You know, we have to go over Canada. So if you go to Toronto, there's lots of Europeans, lots of um, ethnic European groups there. 
uh, more so than in Vancouver. Vancouver is a lot of Asian, Vietnamese, Chinese, Koreans uh, in the West Coast. So uh, I would love to go. I haven't been to the UK before, so I'd love to visit okay. there. It's yeah. kind of a cultural homeland for Canadians because yeah. yeah. we have like the Queen and I guess maybe the king will soon be on our mm -hmm. currency, but it, you know, things are named after the queen, Queen Elizabeth Park, Queen Elizabeth Theater. So going to the UK would feel like going home, our, my cultural home. Many of my favorite writers like J.R.R. Tolkien, T.S. Eliot, they're, they're from the UK. So visiting there as well, but going to Italy, going to France, going to Portugal, going to uh, the Nordic countries would also be some place, places I would love to visit in the near future. Very nice. So, perfect, that's it. Oh, very <laughs> good. Can, can, can we do something I love doing? What? Which is like, I'd like to do my click click. So yes, before yes, we course. just face there. I, I check the focus. Oh, make sure the focus is in, yeah. all right. Yes. Is it in? Yes. All right. So how do you end your videos? Do you say something specific? I don't know. You, you, should, you should maybe think of something. Yes. You, end, you start and you end the same way every time. Maybe you can show your wrist. I don't know. I can thank thank you for coming. Oh, okay. well, there you go. That's that's <laughs> nice zip. All right, and thank you for watching and happy shooting. Thank Peace. you. <laughs> thank you.